Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. Today, Dwayne Taves is at the National Association of Farm Broadcasting meetings in Kansas City, visiting first with Matt Merritt with Poet, a U.S. biofuel company specializing in the creation of bioethanol. Next, Rob Schaefer with the Illinois Soybean Board gives us an overview of uses for biodiesel, and then enjoy this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Next, Tom Bias with Growth Energy speaks about the environmental benefits of ethanol versus oil. We end with Robert White with the Renewable Fuels Association. It's all coming up today on Farm Factor. Stay with us. Closed captioning brought to you by Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff. Progress. Powered by Kansas Farmers. This segment is brought to you by Kansas Wheat. Learn more at rediscoverwheat.org. Welcome to Farm Factor at the National Association of Farm Broadcasting Meetings. Dwayne Taves visits first today with Matt Merritt with Poet. Dwayne Taves joining you with Ag AM in Kansas. And while at the National Association of Farm Broadcasting Meetings in Kansas City, Missouri, a chance to talk a little bit about uh, renewable fuels, uh, bioenergy, and that uh, type of a program that we've put together for you. We've got uh, the folks at uh, POET, uh, Matt Merritt, uh, joins us with the program. And Matt, tell us a little bit about uh, the company and, and where POET stands uh, on uh, renewable fuels. Yeah, well, POET is uh, one of the largest ethanol producers in the world. We have 27 ethanol plants, well, 28 ethanol plants now, uh, spread across seven states in the Midwest. Um, our headquarters are in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, but we actually have a, a pretty good Kansas connection with uh, all of our ethanol marketing uh, handled by POET Ethanol Products, which is out of Wichita. So. We think about uh, the opportunities. Uh, the ethanol industry really is, uh, has got a good foothold now and as we move forward, but there are a lot of factors that play into the success of a plant. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Poet's, been, uh, Poet's been a very successful company because, because we've had such strong support in, in rural America. I mean, we've got, uh, we've got really a lot of buy-in from all the farmers, uh, the local communities, the states have been, have been so supportive of everything that we're doing. And uh, right now what we're, what we're kind of focused on is uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, and, and they've got a pretty important decision coming up, is how much renewable fuel uh, it needs to be blended into the fuel supply uh, for the coming year. Uh, earlier this year, they they gave us a, a preliminary number that was that was really cutting the market a little bit for ethanol. And uh, in the meantime, since then, there's been hundreds of thousands of people who've been sending in comments to the EPA, letting them know, hey, this is a really important industry for America, really important industry for the Midwest, especially. We think about uh, Poet as a company. Uh, mo many people probably don't think of it as an agricultural company, but when you look at the feedstocks that go into those plants, obviously they're a big player. In, in agriculture, right? Yeah, uh, you know, obviously, most of the corn in the U or most of the ethanol in the U.S. is is produced using corn as the feedstock. We take that starch portion of the corn, turn that into ethanol, and then we take the protein, micronutrients, those other uh, parts of the corn kernel. Uh, return that into the feed industry through something called uh, distiller's grains. And then uh, we have a, one plant that we just recently finished construction on, and we've been, been in startup this year, uh, that's a cellulosic ethanol plant, and that uses corn cobs, leaves, uh, husk, kind of that, that plant material, and uses that as a new feedstock to produce even more ethanol. That's the, that's the first of its kind. We're really excited about, uh, about that plant. It's in Emmitsburg, Iowa. We're excited to, to get that off the ground, and, and you know, if that market keeps looking, looking like it's going to be growing, be able to replicate that, that everywhere. And that's, that's a new opportunity for farmers, basically a new crop on the land they already have. Our thanks to Matt Merritt with Poet joining us here in Kansas City. Jamie, we'll send it back to you in studio. Stay with us. Dwayne will be back in a moment with more from the NAFB meetings, including an interview with Rob Schaefer. Next time you see a beautiful field of corn, reach out and thank the farmers who work tirelessly to raise corn for livestock feed, renewable fuels, and exports to feed a growing world population. 
The farmers on the Kansas Corn Commission work for Kansas Corn with grower-funded checkoff dollars that support foreign and domestic market development, research, promotion, and education to expand opportunities for Kansas farmers. To learn more, visit kscorn.com. Buying a car shouldn't be this hard. And at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego, it isn't. It's actually awesome. Whether you want a new or used car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. Even if you want to custom order a new car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. See Toby's team at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego. We're awesome. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Supply. Watch Ag AM in Kansas online at agamincansas.com. Ag AM in Kansas brought to you in part by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. Welcome back to Farm Factor. Let's join Dwayne and Rob Schaefer as they discuss the many uses for biodiesel. Dwayne Tames joining you once again here on Ag AM in Kansas. We continue our discussion about uh, renewables and energy out of agriculture. A chance to catch up with uh, Rob Schaefer with the uh, Illinois Soybean Board, a member a voting delegate with the National Biodiesel Board. And Rob, talking a little about biodiesel, obviously a, a product that has expanded uh, soybean growers' opportunities uh, for profitability. Yeah, uh, biodiesel has been, uh, by the EPA, has been designated uh, America's first advanced biofuel. Um, the majority, majority feedstock for biodiesel is soybean oil. And they crush the soybean, they get three products. They get soybean meal for feeding livestock, they get soy oil, which people could fry their french fries and different things in, or you can take that oil, make it into biodiesel, and then they also they get soybean holes out of it. So it's a value-added product for the Illinois soybean and nationwide soybean farmer. We think about uh, the opportunities uh, for growth within that industry, and uh, it seems like new markets that we're expanding into all the time. Uh, initially, we thought about uh, running it in our tractors, but we're looking at uh, heating homes in uh, in the northeast part of the country as well. Yeah, we, we got to go on a trip to Boston and on a trip to, a trip to New York City, where New York, New York City has a 2% mandate or requirement, I should say, for heating oil. They don't have a lot of access to natural gas or um, LP out in the East Coast. They're basically all off of oil-fired oil burners to heat their homes. And we're taking 2% in New York City of that, basically putting 2% biodiesel in their heating oil to heat their homes. We'd love to get that up to 5 10, 20 percent bio, biodiesel, what we call that bioheat product. We think about some of the attributes uh, with the, the re increased refining that we have done with diesel fuel, uh, removing some of those uh, components, uh, the lubricity that biodiesel brings back to it in engine life uh, looks pretty substantial as well. Yeah, and the biggest thing is that people that are running high levels of biodiesel have to have a very good relationship with their fuel suppliers, number one, to make sure they get qual good quality product and also to maintain their equipment that be the fuel tanks fuel line be the fuel the bulk storage and also the tanks on the equipment um, fuel lines filters that kind of stuff it's not hard it just has to be another level of maintenance that needs to be done to be able to run those those high levels we think about uh, the research and development that went into before it was brought to the marketplace to make sure that it meant all those engine manufacturers requirements as well. Exactly, and that's what us we're also working with the OEMs or the the equipment manufacturer, the engine manufacturers, to make sure that we meet their specs. Um, and then also it gets down to even the microns of the filter that you put on the the equipment as far as the fuel filters. Our thanks to Bob Schaefer with uh, Illinois Soybean joining us as a voting delegate of the National Biodiesel Board from Kansas City, Missouri. Jamie, back to you. Thanks, Dwayne. Don't go away, folks. Next up is this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture, represents grassroots agriculture. The state's largest and most powerful farm organization stands up for its members through leadership development, agriculture education, legal defense, environmental advocacy, farm safety, and risk management. Members also enjoy money-saving benefits. To join our organization today or to learn more, go to www.kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. 
Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The soybean checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Bob Hazelwood, a Barrington, Kansas soybean farmer and serves as chair of the United Soybean Board, joins us. Bob, for USB, it's an exciting time, but also a time where you're looking at the future and a new long-range strategic plan. And there are several changes that are going to be coming up, but uh, let's focus on some of the main changes that USB has in their new uh, long-range strategic plan. You know, when we started our new long-range strategic plan, we started with a clean sheet of paper. And we tried to look at what we felt we needed to do as a as the United Soybean Board, what we felt down the road in five years or so, where we thought the industry might be going, and you know, what we could do to help improve soybean farmers' profitability. You know, one of the things when you have a promotion board and it's a commodity, one thing that's going to happen when you promote your product and increase consumption, you also benefit your competitors. And that's one of the things that we tried to focus on is what we can do to distinguish U.S. soy from the rest of the world. And, you know, in the past we've started working on Ohio Lake soybeans, promoting that because we had lost oil share in the market, in the edible oil market, and Ohio Lake was one way to help to get that back. And we're still going to continue working on that. But, you know, we're looking at ways now to, you know, improve the nutritional value of the soybean meal. Some of our customers claim there's an advantage to U.S. soy over South American meal. And even though the protein level might not be as good, there's other things that help to make it a better product for them. We are continuing to look at those things. And then we're also talking with researchers, whether it be public or private, on things that we could do to possibly help raise the protein content of soybeans. One of the hard parts about that is addressing that current business environment. We've seen it change, but next year it could change. That moving target, I'm sure, is, is hard to judge right at the moment. Yeah, when you look at the business climate, you don't know what mergers and acquisitions are going to do. But, uh, you know, we try to uh, create partnerships with the private industry to help promote that. Uh, That's another part of our plan. You know, we've looked at U.S. infrastructure sometimes, or transportation infrastructure. You know, it's got some questions, and we're going to try working with some group to see if there's things that we can do in the public and private, through public-private partnerships that, you know, work on the locks and dams issues, you know, things that we're going to be looking at that. And we're starting to talk about a pilot program on that now. Bob, as always, we appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. That's Bob Hazelwood, who serves as the chair of the United Soybean Board, a Barrington, Kansas soybean producer, here on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. Hope you enjoyed this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Stay tuned as Dwayne visits with Tom Bias about the environmental aspects of ethanol. Biodiesel made from sustainable resources is diversifying our fuel supply. This year, biodiesel will displace over a billion gallons of fossil fuel nationwide. It's making our economy stronger and our communities healthier. It's working here and across America. Get biodiesel going in your community. Visit americasadvancedbiofuel.com. Tallgrass Commodities offers producers bulk commodities at a reasonable price with reliable service throughout the whole Midwest. To find out more about Tallgrass Commodities, visit tallgrass.us or call 785-494-8484. Heinen Brothers, a fourth-generation Northeast Kansas farm family, knows how tough farming can be. Farmers helping farmers. Heinen Brothers Ag, selling and servicing crop protection products, fertilizer, anhydrous ammonia, cover crops, quality aerial, and ground application. Call today to learn about our extended term financing program, 800-760-4964. HeinenBrothersAg.com. This segment brought to you by Heinen Brothers Ag. Farmers helping farmers by offering quality aerial and ground application, fertilizer, ag chemicals, and anhydrous ammonia. Call today to protect your crop yield. Thanks for staying with us. Now we'll catch up with Dwayne and Tom Bias. 
Dwayne Thames joining you with Ag AM in Kansas. Another opportunity while in Kansas City at the National Association of Farm Broadcasting Meetings Trade Talk. Catch up with Tom Bias with Growth Energy. And Tom, we think about uh, the ethanol energy uh, industry and where it's grown in the recent years. Uh, we continue to make strides, but we need some help in doing that and uh, to help it continue. Yeah, and uh, when we're waiting on the uh, EPA to finalize the rulemaking for the 2014, 15, and 16 volume obligations, and that's a key component because uh, uh, they're the ones charged with implementing the law that Congress passed. Their first proposal went backwards, uh, and uh, now they're about to finalize this program, and we're hoping they listen to the hundreds of thousands of comments they received from farmers, the ethanol industry, academics, and others that said, don't go backwards, go forwards. We think about uh, ethanol, its history and where we've come from. It's unfortunate that some of our biggest adversaries should have been proponents for what we can do for the environment. Absolutely. If you want to talk about carbon reduction, and we got the global talks going on in, in Paris next month, uh, we're 35 percent less greenhouse gas emissions and gasoline and that's with first generation corn ethanol next generation is a, of cellulosic ethanol is almost a hundred percent less greenhouse gas emissions so when you look at the environment and the environmental benefits of ethanol versus oil there's no comparison we think about uh, why some of those folks uh, have drugged their feet so hard. It's territorial. Obviously, big oil uh, has uh, the opportunity to, uh, to lobby on their own behalf. But in the big picture of things, here's something that we can produce, grow right here at home, and really support rural America. Absolutely. If you look at the past six or seven years, it's been the greatest profitability ever in rural America. And, and the ethanol industry helped because we help balance supply and demand. There's no more productive society in the world than American agriculture. As a matter of fact, they do it extremely well in producing whatever commodity. Uh, in fact, do it too well. We overproduce. And what we do is help balance that supply and demand so they, the profitability can be there. Uh, rural America shouldn't be an afterthought on the economic picture of America. It's a strong sector. Uh, in fact, our industry has helped create 400,000 jobs. Uh, 52 billion dollars annually in GDP uh, plus all the environmental benefits and the savings to consumers so uh, it is a, a positive for America and you know uh, we, we look back over the past 50 years and all the money the trillions of dollars that we've spent for our addiction to foreign oil and fossil fuels without an alternative we're an alternative we're 10 percent of our nation's gasoline supply we can do more that's why the fight is coming from oil. They don't want to lose any more market share. Uh, but it is, uh, we're a win-win-win for America. Our thanks to Tom Bias, uh, Growth Energy, joining us here on Ag AM in Kansas from Kansas City at the National Association of Farm Broadcasting Meetings. Jamie, we'll send it back to you in studio. Thanks, Dwayne. Don't go away. Next, Dwayne visits with Robert White with the Renewable Fuels Association. That interview is next here on Farm Factor. I'm a patient of Kansas Regenerative Medicine in Manhattan. I had uh, stem cell therapy in my hips and my left knee. My wife and I, uh, both are patients. We went down there the same day in November. Since then, uh, my hips are feeling a lot better. I can, can work now most of the day if I want to. And uh, before, if I, if I worked in the morning, I was done in the afternoon. Or if I worked in the afternoon, um, I was sure enough done for the rest of the day. I will take action against herbicide-resistant weeds. I will know my weeds, and I will stop them before they go to seed. I will do whatever it takes to give my crops the upper hand, and I will use multiple herbicide sites of action because every action counts. I will take action, this time, for all time. 
Soil is the life of a farm. And for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or for more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor and Dwayne's interview with Robert White. Dwayne Thames joining you once again on Ag AM in Kansas while at the National Association of Farm Broadcasting meetings in Kansas City, Missouri in Trade Talk. Chance to catch up with Robert White uh, with the Renewable Fuels Association. And Robert, a uh, pretty important deadline coming up that a lot of people in the renewables world are, are hoping that maybe EPA listen to the comments uh, from the rural country uh, and where we really need to go with renewable fuels. That's exactly right. November 30th is the court-implemented deadline for EPA to release not only uh, this year's obligations, but last year's and next year's. Uh, we no doubt had multiple hearings. We've had multiple comments, thousands of comments from all over uh, the country on the importance of the renewable fuel standard and really we just want them to enforce the statute that Congress given them. You know the numbers are going to go up slightly if nothing else because of technical errors in their calculations um, but we're more concerned with the methodology for the reduction if they do reduce the statute because if the blend wall is used as their excuse uh, the statute did not give them that authority and I think it'll open up some doors for potential legal challenges. You reference that blend wall. We think about uh, the vast majority of the fuels in the country, uh, gasoline anyway, carrying 10% uh, ethanol in that. Uh, but some exciting opportunities to improve that usage uh, that have come as of late as well. Uh, two weeks ago, Secretary Vilsack in Kissimmee, Florida, announced $100 million of USDA funds going to ethanol retail infrastructure. Uh, that's matched with $110 million in private investment. So $210 million worth of ethanol infrastructure will be in place by the end of 2016. Again, referring back to EPA, if the blend wall excuse is used, that blend wall is going to move significantly next year, and hopefully 2017 can be put on much, much more aligned with the statute as it was originally written. Combating as well, one of the arguments from the oil companies that uh, we don't have the infrastructure place to push this any farther uh, in terms of the ability at the pump for the consumer to take care of that, it addresses that issue as well. Well, it definitely helps. I mean, the, the oil companies that say they have no control over it are the same ones that are blocking it through franchise and, and supply agreements. And we continue to say the blend wall is, is something they built with their own brick and mortar. And if they just get out of the way, uh, which we know why they won't, but if they would, uh, this would take care of itself. So we're, we're very happy to see the, the leadership from Secretary Vilsack, and we hope that the rest of the administration follows suit at the end of the month. We think about uh, the world scene. Obviously, the United States not the only ethanol market or renewables market uh, in, the, uh, in the world, but an important meeting coming up that, uh, that maybe we don't bang the drum as loudly as we should. Well, no doubt uh, the first week of December to Paris, talks on climate change are taking place in multiple countries. In fact, uh, President Obama, Secretary Kerry will be headed to Paris the same day as the uh, RVO numbers come out for the RFS at later this month. And we have been hounding the administration to take advantage of the RFS. You have a 10-year program that has done wonders for climate change. You need to publicly acknowledge that while you're in Paris, as several other countries, I think we're up to 21 countries, plan to mention biofuels as part of their climate change programs. And here the United States, with the largest program on the planet, uh, so far has no plans to mention it. Unfortunate, uh, and we think about what it's meant to the rural economies across the country, supporting what is a, a big piece of our gross domestic product. No doubt about that. I mean, we've seen rural communities in Kansas and across the country revived from whether an ethanol plant's there or not, their presence has helped revive and return some of the young folk to the farms. And unfortunately, we're back into a situation where we have corn price below production cost in, in many areas. And we'd like to do our part in the ethanol industry and grind more corn, but it's up to EPA and exports and some other factors to allow us to do that. Well, our thanks to Robert White, a Renewable Fuels Association, joining us in Kansas City. Jamie, we'll send it back to you in studio. Thanks again for joining us at the National Association of Farm Broadcasting meetings in Kansas City. 
I'm your host, Jamie Bloom, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. We're here every Tuesday on Ag AM in Kansas. Closed captioning brought to you by Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress, powered by Kansas farmers. To see this show and past episodes of Ag AM in Kansas, go online to agamincansas.com.